what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Richard, great to have you here on the Learning Leaders Show. Welcome. Thanks, Ryan. You dedicate your most recent book to your three sons, and I wanted to start there. Let's start high level. What does it mean to you, first and foremost, to be a great dad? I, I think it comes down to modeling the kind of behavior. It's not it's not a surprising answer, I, I think. But I, I do believe quite strongly that children especially, but people in general believe their eyes rather than their ears. Mm. And certainly in terms of the way I was raised, I really strongly believe that it wasn't what my parents told me to do or not to do. It was how they were. And so when you're learning how to be in the world, then what you do is you look around you. And so what I've tried to do is um, is to model a way of behaving in the world, which is to have agency, to have respect, to show kindness, and to treat the world as if it's a good place with good people in it. Um, and there are various examples of when I was kind of raising my boys, when I tried to show them that, like, that the world is a good place and you can help to make it a better place rather than a world to be afraid of. But I didn't tell them that. I didn't sort of say, this is how you have to be. You should be kind. You should be honest. You should, you know, you should treat the world as a good place. Instead, I tried to live like that. And uh, particularly for boys, I think that this sense of just openness to the world and generosity and kindness is in incredibly important to model. Can you think of an interesting story or an example of you modeling that behavior from from your 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 son's upbringing? Yeah, well, I, I like to think that they've seen um, seen me, uh, you know, and and my wife, but just generally the family see kind of acts of acts of kindness. So they've seen us. I'm kind of thinking of an occasion where, you know, if there's someone who's on the side of the road, we'll pull over and see if they need some help. Right, there's, that's happened quite a number of times, or like picking somebody up when it was raining and needed to get a ride somewhere, even though that was inconvenient. Um, but on the other side of it, I remember taking my boys on a cycling, uh, a, a, an ill-fated cycling trip. It was me and the three boys, and we had a, a million punctures, and everything went wrong. And night was coming; we weren't where we were supposed to be. And I had to find somewhere to store the bikes, and we just knocked on the door of this house and said, "Hey, can we put our bikes in your garage?" Um, and my boys were slightly, well, how's this going to be? We're just in the middle of nowhere. And I said, look, people are going to help us. What, when people knock on our door and ask for help, what do we do? We help. And sure enough, this guy said, sure, put your bikes in. It was raining again. He said, what are you going to do now? I said, we're going to get a, a taxi to, to the nearest town. This is in the UK in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and we've, we got to find a room there. And he said, no, no, I'll, I'll take you. So he drove us to the nearest town and turned out he knew the guy from the bike shop. So he had him come out to get the bikes. His name was George. And my sons just, they, they still talk about it to this day, this guy. Uh, so they call him St. George, who is obviously the English saint. But Saint, do you remember St. George? <laughs> and and the lesson there, I think, is just if you ask uh, and you approach the world with that, that, kind, of, that, that kind of mindset, then... Most most of the time, if you approach the world in the right way, the world will be kind back to you. I love that approach, Richard, and identify with it a lot. However, there are skeptics and there are people who see you as a mark if you're like that. Have you been burned by approaching the world this way? Um, if so, how do you handle that? Sure. Um I think it's the minority of times that that, mm -hmm. it, that it happens, but yeah, I can can certainly think there are times when people will, will take will take advantage of your kindness for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but it's but it's the huge minority, and so the way I handle it is just by playing the odds. And so, like if you like the only way to eliminate the risk of being taken for a sucker is to never do anything kind for people without doing eight 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 reference checks before doing it right yep. um and so and that's impossible uh and so you just gotta you, you just have to play the odds and say that even if it's even if you can find the examples where that's not true think about the 99 other examples right where 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 it went the other way um and i just actually another story is that I remember we were walking we were walking along the street somewhere and my 
my youngest son, who was probably two or three at the time, we were chatting to this couple and he just took the hand of the of the woman. So he held her hand and was walking ahead of us. And uh, we were kind of chatting and we'd never met them before, but he just, uh, and the guy was talking to me and he said, well, how, is that, how do you feel about it? She, she actually said, is this okay? And I said, sure, of course it's okay. And he said, how do you feel about that? Like he's just gone up to this woman he doesn't know and is holding her hand. And I said, I feel great about it because kids' instincts are very strong. He wouldn't have done that if he didn't feel quite strongly that, you know, it was okay. Secondly, I'm right here. And thirdly, if I say to him, don't do that, don't hold hands with that strange woman. What message did I just send him? And I've just sent him a message that kind of strangeness is to be feared. Mm. And that's not true. Uh, and I think it's what what a wonderful thing that he's just, he's just, oh, here's this lovely lady. I'll I'll hold her hand. Uh, that's mm. so great. I said, I'm I'm here full of pride and joy. Don't worrying about it. I think it's it's great. <laughs> the chances that the kid, my kid has randomly chosen the one woman in a million that's gonna run off with him. <laughs> it's very uh, it's very, very low. And I'm right here. And so those are the kinds of moments where you just try and um like it is true that you're constructing the kind of world that we live in. I love it, man. Um I, it makes me think of Jim Collins when he was on the show, we talked about making the trust wager, which basically means you do not have to earn my trust. You've got it. You are an outwardly trusting person. Nobody has to earn it. And yes, every once in a while we may get burned, but as you say, playing the odds, it's, it's a far more enjoyable and fulfilling way to live by being outwardly trusting and not skeptical, not skeptical, not a, not cynic, not a cynic. And to me, it seems to attract the type of people that I want to be around when they know that I'm going to lead with trust. And I sense this is how you approach the world as well. Yeah, that that's true. But it's it's also we shouldn't assume that the person that we're engaging with is just like that. When none of us are fixed in that, in our approach to the world, yeah, we're affected by the way that other people treat us. And so, if you trust somebody, they are more likely to be trustworthy. Mm. <laughs> uh, now, not always, of course, you will get burned. And so, you know, we've all we've all had experiences where we've been scammed or we've tried to help someone and they've run 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 away etc but it's incredibly rare i think the uh, most of us will have the the opposite experience where if you treat someone as someone worthy of your trust then they are very likely to be trustworthy they don't want to break that because you've just treated them in a particular way and very most of us want to be treated that way and so if somebody like most of us have been in a situation where let's say we ask them to take us no trust we've all been in a situation where I don't have my credit card or like I've just done a like I, I'll give another example I'm in a grocery store I'm behind this woman she does this huge shop for her family she has two kids for her it's like hundreds of dollars and then she gets to the checkout she doesn't have a way to pay all right we've all been there right I could see that she was almost tearful I, like, I, I, I get it I said I, I'll get it I'll pay I, I'll pay just pay me back uh here's my address send me the check or kind of whatever she's like really Really, I said, yeah, like uh, obviously, like, <laughs> and so it was like I don't know what it was, four hundred dollars or something, right? But even if she's a person who, in a different situation, might have taken advantage, it's like if if she's being treated badly by an institution or an individual, then maybe she would have screwed them, right? And we all yeah. feel better about we all feel better about not being honest with a corporation or an individual that's treating us badly. We sort of think it's their comeuppance, but. I, I knew that whoever she was, the chances that she would say, no, I'm not going to pay that guy back. Ha ha. I've just got 400 bucks out of him. She was a mom. She was in trouble. And most of us in that situation will go out of our way to to, to make sure that, that that trust is repaid. And so like, let's, let's act like that's the way the world is going to be. And it turns out that people will respond in kind. Exactly. I love it, man. Uh, your your latest book, as I mentioned before, that was dedicated to your sons is called Of Boys and Men, Why the Modern Male is Struggling. You, you wrote, I think it was in the acknowledgments or the postscript of the book about people say, oh, what are you writing about? And you start telling them and at times yeah. they they look at you sideways and say, what? Why? And so yeah. I'm curious, what made you want to devote years of your life and a lot of stress? I know what it's like to try to publish books and a lot of stress 
to write about the modern male and how they are struggling? Yeah, well, in the postscript, the, the contrast I draw is between previous books I've written where you can see people regretting the question, oh, you're writing a book, oh, what's it about? <laughs> yeah. And then I say, it's a, an ex a very long intellectual biography of John Stuart Mill, the 19th century philosopher. And they go, ah, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> they start looking like, oh, anyway, I must go to the, uh, let me get another drink, you know, off they go. Um, but as soon as I started saying, I'm writing a book about the struggles of the modern male, uh, of boys and men, Instantly, someone said, oh, that's so great. Let me tell you about my cousin. Let me tell you about my sons. I'm so worried about my son. It's like, uh, you know, you know what I think the problem is? I think the problem is X, Y, Z, you know. The, and, and so this, it was just telling people I was writing the book was part of the research for the book because everybody had a story. Everybody mm -hmm. had a view. Everybody had an opinion. It was very, because it's a very personal issue. Either they are, either they are a male and they've got views on it or they have males in their lives. And so they have views on it. And so it was very interesting to me how I got strong reactions, very personal reactions to people as I was writing the book. And most of those made me feel like I was I was on the right track in tackling this subject because my sense of the debate is that there was a real gap between people's private conversations about this, what they were saying to each other just over the dinner table or the school gates, which is like, yeah, I'm... I'm really worried about what's happening to a lot of our boys, maybe our son, maybe my brother. And the public debate, which was was locked in a pretty old style kind of culture war binary. Um, and and so I felt this discourse, uh, this disconnect rather, in the discourse between what people were saying to me privately, which is like, yeah, I'm really worried about boys and men. And then they go out publicly and they felt uncomfortable saying that in a professional setting and more generally for fear that it meant that they didn't care about women and girls. So there's a there's a zero sum nature to the public debate about gender, which is not true when people talk about it privately, right? If someone has a son and a daughter, they want them both to flourish. They don't think there's a choice. <laughs> they don't think they have to choose between worrying more about their son or their daughter. But once we take it up to a macro level, it does seem as if people pose this false choice between caring about one or the other. Why? Why is it like that? I partly think it's because the the politics of this, and I don't just mean here sort of politics at that at the traditional sense, but just the institutional politics too. When you think about gender diversity in institutions, you think about um, some of the moves that there are around getting great, greater equality around pay and so on, that for so long the, the argument about gender equality has really been won on behalf of women and girls that to even mention the fact that there could now be some inequalities that run the other way can, and I understand this fear, it can provoke this, provoke this fear that in somehow you're arguing against the previous commitment to women and girls. And and I've noticed even as I engage with people in this space is that it's it, it can quite quickly become quite binary. It can quite quickly become quite hostile. Um, and I, you know, because people will react bad, will react one way, and then you react the other way. Someone's unreasonable or <laughs> feels very strongly, so you become you. It, so it creates this sort of billiard effect, essentially, where one kind of person is just uh, reacting quite strongly in a way that makes it harder for the other one to do it. So I think that's that's really what. And then of course the, the culture war at the higher level is such that um, people are kind of driven into corners, and people feel as if but basically that it's you can't think two thoughts at once <laughs> it's basically yeah. the problem and you can't you can't say well this is one of the refrains of the book is that actually we can think two thoughts at once but people are afraid that we can't it's you know what's cool about having a podcast like this richard is i, I mentioned to you before we start recording how i really value diversity of thought and speaking with people in all different parts of the world who have different life experiences and what happens when you do that is you become much more reasonable you become much more aware that the world is is gray, it's messy, it is not black and white, it's not this or that. It's it's almost always much more nuanced than that. And I like talking with nuanced thinkers like you because this is the way the world actually is. And I, I wonder why 
And maybe it's just some of the places on social media or, or other parts of the news where it's like it's either this or it's that or it's that team or it's this team or you're on this side or it's that side. When in reality, when you travel the world and you go and speak, I know you were at a conference yesterday, so you probably just experienced this. The overwhelming majority of people are not like that. They're not in this, it's this or that. They realize that the world's pretty gray, that it's very nuanced. And they're not that extreme. It's just that seems like what we see the most of when we turn on a TV or see something on social media. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, it's a chance for me to talk about my previous one of my previous books on John Stuart Mill, uh, who is the founder, the founding father in many ways of liberal philosophy. And he said, all of us are walking around with some erroneous opinions. We just don't know which ones they are yet. Yeah. And the way we discover which ones are erroneous is in constructive collision with other people's ideas. Mm. Uh, and so like that's the is that the the necessary humility the is necessary. This combination of like holding strong opinions, putting out ideas, but then having the humility to say, oh, that was wrong. I was wrong yeah. about that. You're right about that. Oh yeah. Mm, yeah. I've and you know, and this even happening to me now, even since writing the book, there are things that I'm changing my mind about, would emphasize differently. Um uh, and so if you if you see it as a journey like that, then you are open to that, to the possibility of of exchange of ideas. But the problem I think is that particularly because of some of the amplification of social media that a natural tendency to go for the easier path, right, is a bit easier to not have to, it's quite hard to engage with views that are contrary to your own. And I, I saw I saw recently a study showing that you, you even get a dopamine hit from hearing or reading an opinion from an authoritative person that you already agreed with, mm. right? And so there's something, it's something like, like, and that makes perfect sense to me. It's like, if you've already thought this thing and then you hear somebody say it, right? It doesn't matter. Someone, a podcaster or a booking scholar or someone, you actually get a slight dopamine hit. It's like, yes, I knew I was right all along. And there's this professor person telling me. The trouble is you can find a person of authority now to support any view. Yeah. You just got to get into the right social, um, the social media bubble. So it is, it's, it's a challenging way to live, but I do agree with you that, most people in terms of how they're actually conducting their own lives are aware that it's very how many things are that simple like there's usually you know it's usually two sides to to the story and the, the probably the last mill quote i'll make you endure is that he said when two people are engaged in a disagreement it is almost never the case that one of them has all of the truth and the other has none of the truth it's almost always the case that they share the truth between them. And so when we're engaging, I try to keep that phrase in my head when I'm engaging someone I strongly disagree with or taking a very different view, which is we share the truth between us. We share the truth between us. Now, I might think I've got more of it than them and they might think otherwise, but but at least I'm not going into it saying I'm 100% right. There's there is zero percent right. <laughs> hmm. And it's just a question of the clash of swords and who, you know, who's who's gonna win. And instead it's like, okay, so even if I just let maybe, maybe they maybe they got two percent of the truth. Even just that thought changes the tone of the conversation. Richard, this show is about leadership and people who are building teams, leading teams in usually mostly corporate America, but also beyond. Based on all of the work you've done, the current work and past work, and you think of that specific person, let's say they're a, a mid-level VP at a Fortune 500 company, and they're trying to build a great team and achieve these aggressive goals that are set forth by the company for them, and it's, it's really hard. What would you take from everything you've you've gathered over the years? I know this is a big question, but what would you take from things that you've gathered over the years for that specific person to say, this is this is the more optimal approach to to the building and to the performance that is needed for you to not only keep your job but to get promoted to achieve the personal and professional uh, goals you set for yourself. Yeah. So I'd say a couple of things. Uh, one thing on tone and, and one on more substance. Uh, I think that tone is hugely important, that, that you know, if everyone knows culture matters, climate matters, et cetera. Uh, and I think that creating an environment where you can have some fun, 
as well as be serious is hugely important. Now, I don't know where this quote comes from. I heard it from Amartya Sen, the e economist and philosopher who's one of my great heroes. And he said, I, but I think he was paraphrasing somebody else, the secret of life is to be able to take your work incredibly seriously without thinking you have to take yourself incredibly seriously. Yeah. And that's a distinction that's really stuck with me because there are a lot of people who think that in order for my work to be serious, I have to be incredibly serious, right? I have to almost be pompous about it. But I think the opposite is the case. And Amartya Sen himself is a great example of that. He's he's just like a world-class scholar, huge impact, but he's great fun. You know, yeah. just a kind of really funny, sort of real fun guy to hang, hang out with and and then creates that space. So I think that creating a space where you can have some fun is, is hugely important. And so as the substance is concerned, it's back a little bit to this conversation we just had about creating a, a conversation where it's clear that this is a conversation where all ideas are of equal value. So for this bit of the conversation, we're equals. And almost almost make this explicit, and I'll give you an example of how you do that in a moment, but to say, okay, so we're in the bit of the conversation, which is a conversation. And there's a wonderful philosopher called Theodore Zeldin, actually a historian who write, wrote a book called Conversation, which I thoroughly recommend to people. Very short book called just called Conversation. And in that, he says that the difference between communication and conversation is that communication just moves information around. He says it's like shuffling the cards. But conversation creates something new. It creates new cards. And so a conversation is an interaction between people where something new is made, a new feeling, a new thought, a new idea. And very often in corporate life, meetings are about communication, not mm. conversation. Now, you might need some communication. I'm moving item A, item of knowledge A from my head to your head. But conversation is a space. It's a synapse. It's a it's a synapse in the in the organization. So create that and make it explicit. Okay, this is a conversation. But then you have to make a decision. Then it's like okay, now we're switching mode here. If you're a leader, you have to lead, and you don't want to get stuck in the conversation. Everyone's equal mode, right? So then you have to say you assemble all that. We've done. Now I'm moving mode. Now I'm into decision making mode. Go do it. And an example from this, which I learned from a, a colleague of mine who's from the military, is what they call the salute point in the military. And, and the salute point is, the it marks the, the move from the, this is a conversation where everyone's views are equal, I want challenges, I want everyone to weigh in. To So you can say, listen, listen, general, that's a terrible idea for the following reason. I, no, I don't think we should do that. We should do that. Or how about this instead? Or what about doing it? Right, so you're having that. That's the conversation point. And then the salute point comes where the leader says, okay, we're going to do A. And here's, we're going to do A because of the following reasons. And at that point, everyone salutes. Says, yes, 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 ma'am, or yes, sir. And then you just go do it. I, I've actually been in government in the UK, similar in the civil service, where you say, okay, let's talk about this. Let's do all the policy. Then the minister says, okay, I've got all that. We're going to do A. We're going to do B. And at that point, everyone goes, fine. Then you literally switch modes. It's like flicking a switch from I'm in a conversation here, I'm an equal partner, we're kicking this idea around to, okay, now my job is to go and implement this plan. The plan, by the way, that I was just arguing strongly against 30 seconds ago, it is now my goal in life to make that plan work. And I think sometimes not making the distinction clear between which mode you're in is where a lot of people get into trouble. They think that to be a kind of inclusive leader, you have to not have the salute point. You have to not have the point where you're saying, we're doing X get get on the train but they also sometimes think that in order to be that kind of leader you have to not have the bit before and i think actually followers want that they mm -hmm. need that at some point as a leader you got to i played quarterback growing up uh, richard so mm, i have yeah. a in that role you have to be decisive if you're not decisive if you can't pull the trigger as they'd say and get rid of the ball you can't play you're not going to lead. And I think that that carries over really well to the corporate world because at some point, yes, we can have dialogue, we're going to have conversation, but at some point, the decision has got to be made and the leader needs to take responsibility for that and make it. And this happens over and over and over. And I think that's a big part of it where even the people who are following, they don't want to work for somebody or get behind somebody who can't make that call or can't make a decision just 
wishy-washy all day, every day. You got to, mm-hmm. at some point, step up and make the call. Yeah, and I just, so I completely agree with that. And it's like, so at what point that happens? The reason I like the salute yeah. point, not that I'm suggesting yeah. there from the start, is that because it makes the transition from the, we're talking about this, we're deciding what to do mode, to the, I've decided what we're doing mode. Uh, and and I everybody's think on that, board. On board, yeah. It's like, okay, here's the play, right? So, like, well, da da da, which play? Well, we could do this. I think they call it like disagree know. and commit. Have you heard that phrase, like disagree and commit? Yeah. I think it's in, I watched a TV show called The yeah. Newsroom written by Aaron Sorkin many years ago. Yeah, love and that show. It, yeah. you, me too. I, I was yeah, bummed that the third season kind of fell off and then yeah. it ended. But the, the, they have a, I think it's season two where they did have this highly contentious story where they were thinking about running or not. And that's when this disagree and commit. Once, the people raised their hand. They explained why they disagreed eloquently, did a good job. And then the leader made the call. And once the person, the leader made the call, everybody was 100% on board. They, they got it all out there. And I think that's like the makeup of a good team where people can disagree and, and voice it and they have the safety to do it. But then once we make the decision, we all are behind it 100%. Yeah, yeah, and that's a, it, it's it's difficult because yeah. the if if you if you if the decision doesn't go your way and you're on the record as arguing against it, you fear understandably that that's going to somehow un- seem you're less committed to it. Yeah. So the real art of leadership is to create a culture within which you trust people. We're back to where we started. You trust people to simultaneously be able to argue against a proposal, make the arguments against it, and then fully get behind it. And again, it's like the example of the civil service, like in the uh, in, in the UK government, where I've worked a couple of times, which is that, and I, and I have to tell you that I saw it with my own eyes. I would see these people just make these incredibly strong arguments against a policy. But then almost because they'd done that, or almost because they in their heart, like because they didn't agree with the policy, it became a, a source of professional pride to make the policy work. Hmm. So rather than them saying, yeah, well, let's just, let's see, let's, you know, down pedal it. Let's, you know, like at some level, I want this to fail. It's because I, because, so I can prove I was right type of thing. Yeah, yeah. that I can yeah. say I was right all along. Instead, the really good professional civil servants, you could tell the really good ones, and a lot, and most of them were, was like, no, 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 it's now a point of pride to me to, to prove myself wrong, to make this point. And by the way, it's because they're elected. Nobody elected me. All right, this is the elected person, and they decide because they are the democratically elected representative. And so whatever I think, if that's what they've decided, it is now my professional duty to operationalize that. And I saw people just brilliantly implementing policies that I knew they were vehemently against. <laughs> and, and I thought, yeah, okay, that's that's how it should be. Let's jump back into of boys and men because I want to I want to hit on a few more topics. Let's talk first about education and the fact that boys are behind uh, in education. In fact, you you talk about redshirting. I know you've written about that, and that's that's a phrase you use in the sports world. I redshirted, and people redshirt when they're in college if they're going to play a Mm -hmm. sport. But I've seen so many people do this with their boys, especially if they're into sports. Um, They will hold them back. They will start them late. They will go to eighth grade twice. I've seen that happen with quite a few, sometimes changing schools to make it less embarrassing, I guess, even though it shouldn't be. Um, They will do stuff like this and then graduate at 19 or even 20 um, to be better prepared. And it seems like, based on what you've written, that that's actually a really wise thing to do. Can you unpack that and share more as to why boys are behind when it comes to education in comparison with girls? Yeah, so boys uh, are behind in education at every level now. So I'll, I'll use US statistics, but the pattern is pretty similar across advanced economies. So um, the, the, the kind of terminal uh, data is around college education. So in, in colleges now, college campuses are about 60, 40 female to male, and women are about 15 percentage points more likely to get a four-year college degree than men which by comparison to 1972 
uh, it was 13 points the other way. So in 1972, wow. and, that, and that's an important year because that's when Title IX was passed, which was the US law to promote women and girls in higher education. M men were about 13 percentage points more likely than women. Now it's reversed and gotten a little bit wider. So there is a bigger gender gap in US higher education today than there was 50 years ago. It's just the other way around. Wow. Uh, and uh, so it's just, and, and no one predicted that, by the way. That reflects gaps all the way through school including at high school so if you take the kind of top 10 percent by gpa in high school two-thirds of them are girls so there's two girls for every boy take the bottom two boys for every girl uh, and it just goes all the way through and i've come to feel very strongly there's a whole bunch of things going on there but one of the biggest factors is that boys develop later than girls and this brings us into the red shirting thing they develop physically later than girls you know, girl, I think 10-year-old girls are on average a little bit taller than 10-year-old boys, but that's not true at 16. <laughs> uh, and so just uh, girls hit puberty earlier, they develop earlier. And the reason that matters for education as opposed to athletics, so a lot of people are academically redshirting now, right? It's nothing mm. to do with athletics. It's because mm. of academics. And what happens in adolescence especially is you develop the prefrontal cortex, the prefrontal cortex is a bit of your brain that is not about smarts. Girls aren't smarter than boys or the other way around. They're about the same in terms of just cognitive ability. And on tests, on cognitive tests, girls and boys do about the same. But on GPA, uh, girls just smoke the boys. And when it mm. comes to kind of colleges, they in terms of college completion, they're absolutely way ahead. But that's because these skills are associated with the prefrontal cortex, the skills of turning your homework in, knowing that you have homework, going to class, going to school. So I call the prefrontal cortex is sometimes called the CEO of the brain. So it's literally the back to it's like the leader of the brain. It's the bit that assembles all the information, makes the decisions, uh, is future oriented, is better at impulse control. It's the leader, essentially. And girls' uh, prefrontal cortexes develop about a year or two earlier than boys. Now, girls are developmentally ahead all the way through, but the gap really opens up in adolescence. And the thing about adolescence, of course, is that it's, it's a very critical period for your educational journey, right? If, you, if you're off track at 15, 16, it's tough to make a good transition. And so that's why I suggest that boys should start school a year later so that that I mean, they're behind at five, so it would help early, but it would really help later on at 15, 16, without having to hold them back in eighth grade for the reasons, Ryan, you just suggested, which is it's tough to repeat a grade yeah. for all kinds of reasons. So you think that's that that one simple fix of just waiting a year to go to kindergarten would would make a dramatic difference? Like, have we tested this? Have we seen this in some places? So we don't have great studies because we haven't done it. Yeah. Uh, this in this way but the studies we do have uh, will look at changes in dates cutoffs for school entry or there's a program in Tennessee where I spend most of my time now for example where they changed they changed the arrangement of classrooms which actually meant that some people ended up being older or younger so it's like a randomized study and the kids especially those from lower income backgrounds and there are a lot of black kids in that study too who are old who the boys did better if they went in a, a, a bit later. So there is some evidence that being older for boys helps. And it would, to my mind, just level the playing field a bit. But we would want more evaluation. I'd love a school district who was interested in this to do a kind of proper evaluation of it before we went, you know, went to scale with it. And it's not the only thing. I also think we need many more male teachers. We're seeing fewer and fewer men in our classrooms now. And, mm -hmm. I, and the fact that no one's paying attention to that is great cause of concern to me. And we can maybe talk a little bit more about that. But but the uh, key point here is role models. The key point here is just particularly in subjects like English, where boys are struggling, um, would be hugely helpful. Uh, and also more vocational training, uh, better, more technical high schools and more opportunities for applied learning. Because on average, everything here, of course, is on average, boys seem to do a little bit better than girls with more applied learning styles and struggle a bit more with the sitting in a chair, textbook open, you know, look, turning in your homework kind of learning. What about in the labor market? Uh, you've written about the fact that men are losing ground in the labor market. It seems up until the point of, um, I think, I think we're, I know this is the case with my family too, like the, 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 the woman, when they uh, get pregnant or they have children, it does, um, 
they, they seem to take more responsibility mm-hmm. for that and that impacts their careers not always in a positive way, but men are, are losing ground in the labor market outside of that. Um, w- what have you found there? Yeah, so it's a complex story because, as you say, there's still a gender pay gap, which is yep. largely driven by the parenting gap that you just talked about. So yep. actually women's earnings track male earnings now pretty closely until having kids. But then having kids has just huge impact on people's earnings and employment. And that's not really about gender. It's about the gendered division of labor around parenting. Um, and so, as I say, the gender pay gap is really a parenting pay gap. And what's what's great about the latest social science is we now have more and more same-sex couples to to look at. Um, and actually, very very uh, only a minority of men in same-sex couples have kids, but quite a lot of women do. And if you look at the women in a same-sex relationship or marriage, similar effect. One of them steps out of the labor market when they have a child and similar effect on their earnings. So actually, if you look at a same-sex couple and a heterosexual couple, their earnings trajectories look pretty similar when they have a kid, right? The one who stays home, they see an impact and in in a drop in their earnings. The difference is in a same-sex couple is that very often if they have another child, they'll take it in turns to be the birth mother. <laughs> so so huh. it sort of washes, so it washes out, whereas of course, the dad can't actually be the birth mother. And so it, the the second, so each child a woman has, has a, has more of an effect on her earnings and employment. Um, but the initial impact is very good evidence that it's, a, that it's a parenting pay gap. But if we take a step back from that and just look more generally at the trends, um, women are now 40% of the breadwinners. 40% of US households have a female breadwinner, either sole or main. 40% of women earn more than the median man. But it's not so much just the relative situation, it's the absolute situation. So most American men today earn less than most American men did in 1979. Not all, wow. the ones at the top are doing better, but yeah, just so up to about 60% of the of the distribution, we've taken a bit more than half, not quite two thirds of the male earnings distribution. It's a little bit behind where that bit of the distribution was in 1979, which is an extraordinary economic fact. And one that I don't think is getting enough attention. So that will tell you that, that, that at the median, in the middle of the male earnings distribution, gone slightly backwards. Mm-hmm. That's nothing to do with women coming into the labor market. That's everything to do with the sorts of jobs that men could do, particularly with lower levels of skills, have just gradually been hollowed out. And so there's traditionally male roles in manufacturing, in heavy industry, et cetera. The, the sort of strong back jobs is what they're sometimes referred to. The jobs that need a strong back. Um, especially um, uh, with the decline of trade unions as well, it's just like there are just there aren't jobs like that. So if you're a if you're a guy who graduates high school in the mid- Midwest, you are not going to do as well as your father did if he graduated high school in the Midwest. You're just not, um, and you can see that the earnings, particularly of men with less education, are dropping. And the labor market participation of those men is dropping. So of those with just a high school diploma, one in three of those men are now out of the labor force altogether. It's about 10 million men. So just the, these these economic shocks we've seen from globalization, automation, et cetera, have just disproportionately hit men and they've disproportionately hit working class men. What about at the top end of companies, the C-suite? Uh, how what is What is your research said about that when it comes to men and women? Well, it depends which metric we're looking at. So the pay gap is is pretty consistent across across the distribution for the reasons we've already discussed. And we are seeing still that right at the top, and this is true in politics as well, there's still a skew towards men. So if you take in terms of leadership positions, it's getting better. <laughs> and in fact, even during the pandemic, the share of uh, women managers, senior managers increased. And really? so, and that, yeah. I would have thought it went the other way, given the homeschooling and that usually the moms bear the brunt of that. Yeah, it's very interesting that the uh, the initial worry when the when the recession hit um, was that it would be a she session. That was the language; it would affect women more. All the previous recessions since World War II have been he sessions. They've hurt they've hit men much more than than women, partly for the reasons we just discussed. But there was a big fear this one was going to be different. But it turned out that fear was largely unfounded and that women's employment has actually returned back to pre-pandemic levels a little bit more than male earnings have 
um, and especially middle-aged men are still below pre-pandemic levels in terms of their employment. And so whilst the fear, the initial fears were well-grounded, the, the, the evidence was that um, actually it hasn't had the effect on women's employment that people were afraid that it would. And in the meantime, we did see the steady uptick in the share of women in senior management positions. So right now, there's a, a debate going on among economists about why haven't the men come back to work, <laughs> not why haven't the women come back to work. And so it was actually literally the opposite of what people feared. Hmm. Um, but if you go right to the top, like Fortune 500 companies, I think it's, is it 44 CEOs are women? Of fortune 500 companies something like that 44 45 someone could we can google it's easy to google now that's not parity that's a long way from parity but it's also a lot more than what it was in 1990 which was zero really and yeah and so actually wow. in a it, so even and uh even at the top the progress has been incredibly rapid from a very low base in that case zero same in Congress, same in um, other high level positions, which doesn't mean that it's job done. In fact, I've argued for quotas for women in politics because I really worry about, I think in political life, that's a real concern to be representatives. Right? You want the House of Representatives to be representative. Uh, in business, I think there's good evidence that having more diverse top teams uh, is good for those companies. Mm -hmm. The evidence on that is quite, it's, it's hard to get good evidence for that. It's hard to get cause and effect there. Um, but I'm reasonably convinced that having a good mix of um, backgrounds and mindsets is good in top teams. Uh, and so there's a strong, there is a business case for diversity. It doesn't necessarily have to be the CEO, of course. But I'm just seeing the pipeline is getting bigger, is getting better and better. The trend line is up. And so those trend lines are going the right way. And I think it's really important here to distinguish between trend lines going the right way and trend lines going the wrong way. And even if you, even if it's not mission accomplished, if the trend line is going the right way, you can have reason to feel good about it, like gender pay, employment at the top, et cetera. But there are other trend lines going the other way, such as male employment, male earnings, and so on. So it's important not only to look at the level, but the trend. What do you think of the phrase toxic masculinity? If you'd asked me five years ago, I would have probably been ambivalent about it. I would have said, yeah, I can see why it's sometimes useful, sometimes not. I'm now very strongly against it. Uh, I've come to believe that it's a very unhelpful term. And we should, if it were possible to do this, we should push it back into the margins of academia where it came from in 2016. Like before 2016, it was mentioned about 15 times a year in obscure academic journals, criminology journals. And then with Donald Trump and Me Too, it exploded and became part of the main, mainstream language. And since then, and most feminist scholars who look at it would agree with this, since then it's become so arbitrarily used and so poorly defined that it's just become close to just a, just a catch-all for stuff that guys are doing that you don't like. Um, and it actually repels a lot of men. I think by, by putting the word toxic next to the word masculinity, then for all the intellectual hoops you can try and jump through saying, no, 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 I, 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 there's, I don't mean all masculinity. I don't mean masculinity is bad. I just mean there's just toxic masculinity. It, you, you can't do it. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to pull off intellectually. And at an emotional level, I do not want my, I didn't want my boys to grow up thinking that there was something toxic inside them. Um, uh, this, it, it reminds me increasingly of the idea of like original sin in some Christian theologies. It's like there's this there's this thing that's passed down generation to generation since Adam, which is original sin, and you can never get rid of it. You're always going to be fallen. Uh, and there's a bit of that in the toxic masculinity thing, which is like there's always a bit of you that's potentially, if not actually toxic, potentially toxic. And what, I just think that's a really unhelpful way to frame it. Yeah. What does it mean to you to be a man? Well, there's the, lots of boring biological answers, of course, but that can get you into some interesting territory too. Um, just being natal, I mean, natally and physically male. And so I think there is a physi there's a physiology to it for sure. So male and female bodies are different and our hormones are different. 
Um, I think of more in, the more interesting ones are more interesting definitions of those when it's in society. So how how do you act in society? What does it mean? And the difficulty here again, it's back to where we were a while ago at the nuances and the just and the the idea of the overlapping distribution. So as soon as you start saying there are some average differences between men and women, people think they they miss the average bit and just go straight to binary. It's a bit like the gender pay gap thing, right? Women earn less than men. Well, actually, forty percent of women earn more than the average man. The distributions hugely overlap, but people here, women here, men here. So you hear an average and see a binary. And it's the same with this. And so it's treacherous territory because you'll get some people saying, oh, it's binary, and other people saying there are no differences at all, or or the only differences are socialized. And I don't I don't think that's true. And I talk in the book about some of the differences between men and women in our preferences and psychology that cannot be explained by socialization alone. But I, I'll come back to a quote that I use in the book from the headmaster of Stowe School, which is a private school in the UK, a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, he said that his goal, it's a boys' school, was to create men who would be acceptable at a dance and invaluable in a shipwreck. And someone asked me the other day, can you can you mod- can you update that? And I try so well, I guess good in a cocktail party useful in a burning plane i don't know no it's actually fine it's good as it is people know what you mean by that and so to be a man is to actually have to be able to conduct yourself in society to treat people respectfully and kindly the way we discussed earlier um uh, but at the same time to when if if stuff hits the fan to be willing to put yourself on the line to show some physical courage as well and so I think that's cl- that's quite close to to what it being what it means I think to being able to be a man, which is to have this combination of a so a so a way of being socially, but also have the potential there if it comes to it, and mer- hopefully very rarely does come to it to actually be willing to be actually willing to put yourself put yourself in harm's way. But what if I could picture a a, a woman leader? listening right now to you richard and saying like well that's but i can do that what do you mean i can i'm good at a dance i'm good when the when the house is on fire i'm gonna be running in there to get the dog and my kids and everything else yeah what do you mean why do i need the man why 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 can't i be that person yeah well the first thing i would say is overlapping distributions (laughs) it is also quite possible that the women who are in leadership positions are going to be at the quotes quotes masculine end of various distributions, mm-hmm. um, uh, and I'll, I'll give an example of this that, 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 that potentially gets me into trouble with my wife. But one of the differences between uh, agree between men and women is on the agreeable disagreeable distribution. Right? So agreeable here means caring what other people think of you, and on average, women are a little bit higher on agreeableness. Is one of the big five personality traits a bit higher on agreeableness than men? Right, on average. But the distributions overlap a lot. And I'm much higher on the agreeableness dimension than my wife is. So I get into trouble by by describing my wife as disagreeable. And and I mean it in this very personality. And I'm probably too agreeable sometimes. Hmm. Right. And actually, as a leader, back to a bit where we were before about this balance, actually, if you are too high on the agreeableness personality trait, in other words, you really, really are very sensitive to what people are thinking of you all the time, it's hard to be a good leader. Because you're gonna you're gonna piss people off, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a good chance that leaders, I think, as evidence, this leaders probably do are, aren't very high on the agreeableness trait, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so everything else equal, that might mean that depending on how you define leadership, you are going to see at least a modest gender gap, but it's going to be modest. And so, yeah, the women can do all that. The only, and of course, and you know, I'll give you another example from my background, like Margaret Thatcher. When she became prime minister, only 5% of members of parliament were women. Now it's a third. Margaret Thatcher was not high on agreeableness uh, at all. And there were many, many aspects of her leadership that I think would be quotes defined as masculine. They happen to be in a woman, right? So you can simultaneously think that these things d- uh, differ on average and not think they're in any way determinative of how any individual is going to be. That's the problem people make. That's 
is that you kind of go, mm. oh, on average, women are more like this, men are like that. And so, oh, well, you're a man. So I'm going to assume you're like that. No, no, no. No, no, that's that's the huge mistake. Um, but I would say on the running into a burning building thing, here I think the evidence, if it's not your own child, so if it's your own child, men and women will run into a burning building to get their own kid. But if it's somebody else's, it's only men that do it. Uh, really? And I, I, yeah, I was actually, I learned this from Carol Hoover who has a book on testosterone. There's something called the Carnegie Hero Fund which awards medals for civilian bravery every year. And this is people who not in the course of their professional job or for their own family have risked their lives and very often given their lives to save others. 95% of the recipients are male. And that is not for want of trying to find women that have done it. But if you want to find, if I tell you, these are real stories from the last year of a 15 year old who lost their life going into a river to save a mother and child and a 17-year-old who did go into a burning building to save a family, both of whom lost their lives in doing so. Do you think they were male or female? Both both male. And they're just, they're just male. Um, and, and that's consistent with the evidence that men are willing to, to they're, they're more physically risk-taking, and that can be a really bad thing in many contexts, but it can be a good thing when it comes to being willing to risk their own lives to save the life of another who's not an immediate family member or because they're being paid to do so is an almost exclusively masculine pursuit. Now, mm. in most boardrooms, the building's not burning. Um, and so I'll say one more thing, which is I don't think it's made it into the book, but if one of the differences, again, on average between men and women is a, is a risk-taking appetite, is that men on average, have slightly higher tolerance for and, and willingness and desire to take risks than women do. Um, and there was a nice study which looked at companies that had female CEOs and COOs and then male CEOs and, and sorry, CFOs, CEO and CFO. So male, male and female, female. What they found was that the female brand firms were a little bit less profitable but less likely to go bankrupt. And the male firms were a little bit more profitable on average, but were more likely to go bankrupt. Hmm. And that's consistent with the evidence that that on average, men have a slightly higher appetite for risk. So what's your interpretation of that? You can interpret it, uh, it's, it doesn't appear to be just socialization. So what it, your interpretation of that seems to me sh shouldn't be to say, oh yeah, it's because of men that we have recessions. It's because of men that we had you know, the 2009, it's too much testosterone. It's, it's men's fault when the economy crashes. And so if we could just get rid of all the men, right? If we could sweep all the men out of the C-suites, then we'd have a better economy. Well, we'd have a less profitable economy if that study is right. And I should emphasize this one study. My interpretation of that is that's why you need mixed teams. Yeah. Uh, on those attributes, you need a mixture of risk profiles in your top team. And if on average, those vary by gender, it's one more reason to have that gender mix. But what you don't want to do is only have women who are like men <laughs> or only have men who are like, like, and you want to find men who are like women. In the end, what the mix you're after is the risk appetite. You're just using gender as a proxy for that, as you do for all other kinds of diversity. Mm -hmm. Shane Snow wrote a book called Dream Teams, and we talked about it on this podcast multiple times where one of the number one, he, he did a giant research into teams that effectively did what they were set out trying to do. And one of the number one characteristics of those teams was a diversity of experiences, a diver diversity of thought. So these people yeah. with different backgrounds, different schools, there was a mixture of Ivy League and public schools and different life experiences when they come together and work together that they produce the best results. I'm curious, this difference between male and female and as well as that Carol Hoover Award, which which was really opening mm. my eyes now, I'm still thinking about this. Is this a nature or nurture thing? Is this in our DNA? Are we born this way? Are just guys born this way and girls are this way? Or what is it? Like, I don't want to, again, be this this or that or black and white because I think I've, I've grown to live in a more nuanced world. But the nature or nurture question is one that comes up a lot in just leadership in general. So I'm curious how this applies in, 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 in uh, male and female. 
Yeah. So the you know, the the obvious answer is that it's both, and the question right. is how do they how do they interact? It's really how they interact that's the key question, I think. So, so the extent that there are some some differences that occur in nature, uh, again with overlapping distributions, some of that you know, some some of that comes with the territory. And so, if you take let's take three, I've mentioned risk already, um, potential for aggression, potential or physical aggression, and sex drive. Right. Those are three dimensions where you're seeing pretty big differences between men and women. Hmm. Um, obviously, talking about natal natal men and women, and that's largely driven by you know, hormones and um, evolved psychology. And they all make perfect sense. So the risk one, which we already mentioned, right? One of the one of the facts that really kind of stopped me in my tracks when I was writing the book was the fact that we have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors which is really like a it's a good dinner this is a good this is a good this is a good one if if, if conversations ebbing around a dinner a dinner table how, say, how does did that you, work did, did you exactly exactly how does that work because you're like well everyone needs a mother and a father right so <laughs> hang on so but through the through the arc of this is Roy ba Baumeister's work um across human history so we go back all the way through human history we have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors and the reason for that is because the reproductive success of men has been much lower historically than women so throughout human history men have only had about a 50 percent chance of reproducing whereas almost all women have reproduced hmm. all right so if it's so it's a coin toss so half the men are born they don't reproduce so they, they just they die without passing on their DNA, whereas almost all the women do, right? And so you know, as Baumeister puts it very bluntly and says, in order to be successful, society needs all the wombs it can get, but doesn't need very many penises. Uh, he says we have a penile surplus, which is kind of brutal when you think about it, um, but it's true. And so, and actually across human history, that's what's happened is that... Uh, men have only had about 50 50 percent chance of reproducing and that's because 95 percent of human societies have been polygamous and specific specifically polygamous i.e men having multiple wives and so what's typically happened is that successful high status men have reproduced with a lot of women right how, how many varies by the society genghis khan is the most famous example but certainly more than one whereas lower status unsuccessful men don't reproduce at all the reason that matters is because it means that risks are worth taking for men. It means if you're a guy and you've only got a 50% chance of reproducing, go on the war, you know, go and try to make some money, commit a crime, do, do, do anything to try and increase your status because otherwise you're going to be an evolutionary dud, which of course is everything we're hardwired not to do. And so whereas for women actually protecting themselves so that they can reproduce is incredibly important. Their bodies are incredibly valuable. Whereas for men, it's like, well, there's a 50% chance I ain't going to reproduce anyway. So when when someone says, hey, come to war, join me in this cruise, or, yeah, sure, why not, right? Anyway, well, uh, it's a little bit of a digression into kind of evolutionary psychology. And so it means that some of this stuff does come sort of like the risk-taking one or the aggression one or the sex one. But what's really then hugely important is how is that expressed in societies, right? So physical, you know, being more phys potentially physically violent, right? Like 95% of violent crimes committed by men in every known human society. But the levels of crime hugely change. So violent crime in the US obviously has been a bit of a recent spike, but before that, almost halved in the last 30 years. Hmm. And violent crime in Singapore is a fraction of what it is in Malaysia, just a few miles away. And so what does that tell us? What that tells us is that culture and nurture are much more important in the expression of these traits. You can think about sex as well. Like how do men express their greater sex drive, right? That, that usually varies. In fact, you could even argue that's changed the last few years in, in US society. And so how and whether and when these differences are expressed is all about culture. So the irony of the nature-nurture debate is that it is not that recognizing natural differences makes culture less important. It makes it more important 
because culture is the way that we learn how, when, and whether to communicate these natural tendencies we might have. And so not only is the binary of nature nurture binary tired and silly, it's actually unhelpful because there are a lot of people who think, no, 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 I need to deny any natural differences in order to have equality. No, 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 no. By doing that, you actually make those natural differences more powerful because you don't accept like how do we help boys become men well part of it is by teaching them back to where we're talking about our own, you know my own sons and so on part of it is not by saying you know that stuff you've got that aggression that's that that horniness um you know that risk-taking stuff that's all just socialized that's all because we gave you the wrong toys when you were young whatever so we just need to get we just need to expunge that from you right we'll, do, we'll get we'll, we'll, don't worry you're a blank slate we'll wipe you clean that's not helpful What's actually helpful is to say, yeah, that kind of comes with the, that comes with the territory. I'm afraid if you're a guy, let's talk about how to deal with that. Let's talk about an appropriate way to express those things, as opposed to an inappropriate way. Let's talk about when it's good to express them and when it's not. That's actually the art of human civilization. Hmm. Uh, man, I, I I could listen to you all day, man. I I'm learning a lot. My eyes are being opened. I think it's a, a, a critically important topic so i'm grateful that you've decided to write about it. i have one more question before we run though let's say you're meeting with somebody who's at the beginning of their career maybe they they graduated college and let's let's say this could be a a, a man or a woman and they want to do good they want to leave a, a positive dent in the world right they care about society what are some general pieces of life slash career advice you'd give to that person wow <laughs> Well, I don't have lots of Brookings studies to support what I'm about to say. So that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> and I have to say, Ryan, this has been an incredibly interesting conversation. Um, you know, one of the most wide ranging and surprising ones that I've had as I've talked about these issues. So thank you wow. for thank you for taking us into sort of spaces that I perhaps haven't been into before. I would say that the chances that you're going to know exactly how your own unique talents and skills are going to be best deployed in the world early in your career are very, very low. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're going to be one of those lucky people that just kind of knows, right? So my brother was always going to be a doctor and he, he, he was a doctor. Um, partly, I think, because he was, he can remember, this is the tragic part of it, he can remember when our younger sister died. He was going to the hospital when she was, when she died. And he said from that, he's never, ever thought he could be anything other than a doctor. And he and I have talked about this, and it seems implausible not to think that's something to do with the fact that he was a witness in hospitals to his sister dying. And he's an amazing doctor. And just like, there's never been a moment where he's thought, well, should I be a journalist? Should I be an engineer? Whereas I have like zigzagged the hell around by comparison. I was much younger at the time, so I don't have that that memory. And also I'm suck at math, so... Regardless of the psychological explanation, I would never have been a doctor, doctor. But I think most people, it just takes a while, right? Even our, our brains don't, our prefrontal cortexes don't stop developing until the mid-20s, especially if you're a guy. And so just it takes a while to settle our skills into the world. And so don't rush. It's not a race. Life expectancy is going up for one thing, but it's not a race. Don't treat it like a race. There is a tendency to treat particularly early in your early career as a race and you're looking at everyone around you and like they're ahead of me they're earning more they're doing this they've made whatever it is just, they've made manager right um try to have more patience with yourself trust the labor market the your skills will find a place to flourish in the labor market if you trust it but don't rush it if you lock yourself in too early and you get yourself into a kind of you know a, a, a an overly rapid race too early then I think that, that then then 20 years later, there can be some struggles. So have patience with yourself. Trust the labor market. Take your work seriously, but not yourself seriously. And 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 do everything you can to be the kind of person that people want to work with. We're all human, right? We're all human. And that means we're kind of just like, it just makes a huge difference to be the kind of person people want to work with. Uh, and so take take that for what it's worth. Um, because my my own 
you know, clear in my own career that I, you know, just, it just matters. <laughs> like work is a big part of our life. And so being around people that it's great to be around, that really matters too. It's, you know, it sounds so obvious, yet it is not. And being pleasant and kind and easy to work with will get you a lot farther than you could ever imagine thinking like, wasn't that obvious? It's not, it's really not. I think in the, you're in the speaking world, right? Being, uh, when somebody books you to speak, being someone who is very easy to book and to go through all their stuff and to get up and kill on stage is a very valuable thing for those people who book speakers. But they tell you stories every time about the nightmares they have with people. And they're like, thank you for just making this so easy. I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes that's right. it's just, it, it, it gets you far just being pleasant to work with, you know, the pre, the prima donnas. I mean, I've had experience <laughs> on both sides of it and I, I won't say who, but there's someone who is now, I know him pretty well. And he's just a nightmare. I mean, <laughs> actually he's just reliably horrible just before an event and in the run up to an event, just horrible. Um, and I, I got to tell you, it makes you much less likely to want to book him, et cetera. For and so sure. if you're a prima donna, then you need to be in the top 0.001% of your profession to get away with it. And so if you're not in the top 001%, don't be a prima donna. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> be nice. <laughs> be nice yes. and be respectful and be thankful. Um, and that just goes such a long way. It's not, it's, uh, it doesn't, it costs very little. And I'm, yeah, like you, we, I'm, in, I'm in this world quite a lot. And I'll, I'll make a point, some of the like, dropping a note to the person who did all the organization. Yep. Um, particularly if they made my life easier and I do something, I'll try and drop them a note. You don't need to drop a note to the senior person, right? right. They booked you, they had you come along. It was all transacting, you know, great. But who was the person that did your hotel, did your flight, did your, or whatever the equivalent is in your world? Or maybe the security guard in your building that's looking after you, or the people that bring in the mail or whatever, right? Just like it's them that and and if and if you're able to be kind and thoughtful and engage with the people who are doing those basic things for you the chances are that will spill over into the rest of your working life as well um uh, it's it's you know so people kind of you know what's it kiss ass upwards or kind of whatever it's completely wrong right <laughs> you want to be you you want to be holding your boss to account but you, you know you want to be being as kind as possible with everybody else and just have a little bit of fun have a smile just like yeah. You know, just like, yeah, be nice. Be nice to come back to what you said. Like, <laughs> the thing that you know, what so the ways <laughs> Richard, Richard, a funny thing about this. Whenever I'm uh, making an introduction bef between like two, uh, I don't know the best way to do it, two like important people. Everyone's important. You know what I mean? Like maybe they have a bit of fame or something. You're making the intro. I try to be as casual as possible by saying like, look, we're not more important than other people. So I use the word like dude, or I'll, I'll give them a compliment that is, that is more funny than a, an actual compliment. I won't cite their actual bio that's on the website. I'll cite something yeah. like, Oh, he or she, and I'll use something that's embarrassing about them. Like humanize people too, when you're making these intros. And it's funny how quickly the people become people like how they become real humans or even talk about how they you know they struggle with 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 anything that's a, a nominal task and i think doing that also is like in that vein of yes we take our work seriously but we're all just a bunch of idiots trying to figure things out and and none of us really have yet we're just trying to inch along and i think people seem to respond better than that than for us to think we're more important or that I'm just going to do use the, the canned bio to make intros for people. Yeah, no, I love, I love your approach and it's, yeah. and most people, most people will appreciate it. And if they don't, don't book them again. Yeah. Yeah. Does it work? <laughs> yeah. Simple. Anyway, I could go all day, man. Uh, the book is called That's of great. boys and at least the latest book is called of boys and men, why the modern male is struggling, why it matters and what to do about it. Uh, highly recommend it. This is not just for guys to read this is for everybody to read. It's really, I mean, uh, Richard's an amazing writer on top of uh, on top of an important topic that I think is something that we're going to be dealing with for, for a long time. So Richard, thank you for being here. I really appreciate how thoughtful you are, especially with the way my brain works. It can be wide ranging and I can go anywhere at any time just based on what I'm most curious about. But I've learned that that's seems to produce the best stuff for both me <laughs> and as well as people mm -hmm. who listen. So thanks for being here, man. I'd love to continue our dialogue as we both progress.
Well, likewise. As I said, that was both fun and serious, Ryan. <laughs> Good. Love it, man. Thanks so much.